Go ahead and try this question. If you want to get an 800 on the SAT math, a 36 on the ACT math, there are a lot of factors that go into that. And this video is going to share one very powerful and important thing you have to do, a tip to move you closer to getting 800s and 36s more often. Because you can never guarantee it. All you can do is maximize your chances. And this tip will show you how you can do that. And the tip is as follows. Now this question, I made it up myself. It's based on real questions that I've seen before. This would probably be ranked like a medium to hard something, certainly in the second half of the test. I don't know exactly um, the, what the difficulty would be. If you want, you can leave a comment below. Let me know if you thought this was easier or harder or even medium. But the point is when you're doing math questions on these tests, if you can solve a problem in more than one way, if you can come at a problem from multiple directions, and even if you come at it from multiple directions with multiple methods, even if you get the same answer every single time, especially if you get the same answer every single time, that's a really good sign that you're getting it right. Most of the time when we do math questions, we do it one way and we get the answer and we're happy and so we put it and then we move on. And yeah, you'll probably get it right most of the time. But if you could then do it another way and maybe even a third way to really make sure you get the same answer each time. That basically guarantees that you're gonna get it right. Now here's the thing, I know time is an issue. You don't have unlimited time. If you did have a limited time, you would be able to do all these problems in multiple ways. The point is, with the time that you're given, you wanna make sure you use every single second so that if you have extra time at the end, you go back, try questions multiple ways, make sure you can get multiple solutions for that particular problem that line up to be the same answer. If you can do that, you're just maximizing your chances of not making a mistake of getting that question right. So on a question like this, I've figured out at least five ways, five different ways, of course they're all related, but five distinct ways to do this question. And uh, if there are more, if there are other ways to do it that I didn't consider, let me know. Now, of course, when you're doing this problem in a real test, you wouldn't do all five ways. Maybe you would try two. Or maybe if you had a lot of time, three. But the more ways, again, that you can do it, the better things are going to be for you. So let's look at some of the ways to tackle this question. A, B, C, D is a rectangle. E, F, G, and H are the midpoints of their respective sides. And O is the center of the rectangle. What fraction of rectangle A, B, C, D is pentagon H, E, B, O, G? In other words, the shaded region. So one way to do this, it's more of a way to get at least a guess, is to estimate. It doesn't say figure not drawn to scale. So we can take a look at this and say, hmm, what fraction of the whole rectangle does this shaded region represent? And notice if you take this triangle right here, this will fit into this unshaded region just based on the way the midpoints and the dimensions of the rectangles and triangles work. So if you look at it that way, fill that in. Now think of, just imagine this whole side is blank white. You can see the shaded region doesn't even take up half of the whole rectangle, right? It's short of half. So if you see that, you know your answer's got to be less than half. So we could get rid of E, we can get rid of D, we can get rid of A, because one quarter seems to be too small. So it's probably either B or C, and then you can make your guess based on that, which one you think is closest. So that would be one way, method one would be to estimate. And at the very least, you can get a guess out of two, and you might even feel comfortable picking you know, B here, because B ends up being the answer, uh, just because it may look closer to three-eighths than anything else. So that's one way to tackle it. What's another way to do it? This way is to, perhaps what some of you did, plug in variables for the lengths of the sides and then try to find out the area of the pieces and the area of the uh, whole rectangle using those variables. So for example, I could call this x and 2x. Actually, let's make this 2x and 4x which means this side is 2x, this is 2x, this is x, this is x due to, due to the midpoints. And then you can kind of split these up into three triangles. You can say, okay, this triangle has a base of 2x and a height of x. What is its area? What's this guy's area? What's this guy's area? And once you do all that, you can find the total area of the shaded region. Then you could find the total area of the rectangle by doing 4x times 2x. And then you put the rate shaded area shaded area over the total area, and then you see which of the choices you get. That could work. As you can see, I'm not going to go through it because it's super complicated. You got to deal with these X's and these multiplying and the formulas. Kind of a pain, but that could work. That's method number two. Not one I recommend, but definitely one that, sure, could work. 
What's another method to do it? Another method is to, kind of like we did before, instead of plugging in variables for the sides, let's just plug in side lengths. Let's make this 2, and let's make this 4, which means this is 2, this is 2, 1, and 1. And notice this is much easier. It's very similar to the algebraic way we were looking at before, but it's much easier because you're dealing with numbers. right? So what's the total area of this rectangle where it's length times width, which is 8? And what's the area of each of these triangles? We'll notice this triangle has got a base of 2 and a height of 1. So triangle area is 1 half base height. So 1 half 2 times 1 is just 1. And you'll see that each of these triangles actually has the same dimensions. So each of these triangles has area 1. So 1 plus 1 plus 1 is 3. So the shaded region represents 3 eighths of the entire rectangle because you put the area of the shaded region 3 over the area of the uh, entire rectangle. That's another way to do it, plug in numbers. What's a fourth way to do it? Fourth way to do it is to plug in numbers, but instead find the area of the unshaded region and subtract it from the area of the uh, shaded region, uh, of the entire rectangle. So again, we plug in, this is going to be 1 and 2, 1 and 2, 2 and 1. And one. So we can see that this is going to be area 1, that'll be area 1, this rectangle will be area 2, and this area of the triangle will be 1. 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 2 is 5. If the entire rectangle is 8, 8 minus 5 is 3. So that means this area has got to be 3, so it's again 3 eighths. That's another way. As you can see, very similar to the shaded method that we just did previously. The only difference is, since you're looking at the unshaded region, occasionally that's an easier way to do it. Maybe on a different question, the unshaded would have been easier than trying to find the shaded area instead. So that's why it's a different method. I mean, it's certainly related, but it's distinct. Finally, the last method that I've come up with, and I think the best and the fastest method by far. So we look at this figure and they tell us that H, G, E, and F are all midpoints. And we might realize something, that if I start slicing up this figure, I can slice up this rectangle into four congruent rectangles. Each of these rectangles can then further be subdivided into triangles, right, along the diagonals like this. So notice that each of these rectangles is a quarter of the entire rectangle. Each of these triangles is a half of each of these smaller rectangles. So in other words, it's a half of a quarter. In other words, it's an eighth of the entire rectangle. So this represents an eighth of the rectangle, this represents an eighth, and this represents an eighth. So one eighth plus one eighth plus one eighth is three eighths. That, I think, is the fastest way to slice it up and uh, see that you can figure out that each of these triangles is a congruent triangle, of course, and some fraction of the whole, in this case, one eighth, because if you look at it this way, you can fit eight of these rectangles in the entire, or eight of these triangles in the entire rectangle, right? So here's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And once you see that, each of these represents one, so it's three eighths total. So again, you don't have to do all five of those methods when you're doing the real test. You don't have the time for that. But if you could do it two ways, like if you can do it this way and then maybe double check by plugging in or do it this way and double check by estimating just to make sure you're on the right track, anything like that, the more different, the more ways you can come at a problem, the more ways you can get the answer, you're just upping your chances at getting an 800. And that's really what it takes. The students who get 800s and 36s are the ones who make sure they've gotten an answer right. Not just, you know, come up with one approach and find you got it, that's great, but really make sure by trying the problem in different ways to, to find, kind of triangulate around the answer. So this is one example, and on other math problems, whenever you do a math problem for practice, take some time after, think what are some other ways I could have done it? And the more you can build that problem-solving skill, the better you'll get overall at the section, and the more likely you'll get that perfect score. To learn more about Reason Prep's SAT, SAT subject test, and ACT video courses, go to reasonprep.com slash enroll, and you can find the link in the description below the video.